Eight years ago, Radio Health Journal featured a story about doctors and their dress code, namely the white lab coat. Where did it come from, and how did it come to be the attire so many of us expect doctors to wear? The ultimate reason we concluded back then was that it inspires confidence and trust in the patient. In the last century, the white coat appeared, and it was really a way to associate medicine or disassociate medicine with that of the barber shops from times past and associate it more with science and scholarly activity. But times have changed. According to Dr. Gonzalo Bierman, an infectious disease specialist, professor of medicine, and hospital epidemiologist at the Virginia Commonwealth University Health System. The issue with the lab coats is that they're infrequently laundered, that we know that lab coats and other apparel can have a high bacterial load of pathogens, and that in between patients, these lab coats are not cleaned. In a word, what you might be thinking right now is, ew. Most patients have probably never imagined that their doctor could be bringing an infection along with him. A lot of the common things that are worn in hospitals that are associated with significant kind of bacterial bio burden. That includes things like long sleeve apparel, whether it's a white coat or long sleeve dress shirts, ties are another component. Stethoscopes are commonly known to be well colonized, and they're not disinfected or cleaned in between patients. So we were basically highlighting things or components of apparel and components of medical equipment that are well known to be colonized with bacteria, and these may be driving some hospital-acquired infections. In a recent article published in the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine alumni magazine, you see Bierman in two photographs side by side. One is titled, What Not to Wear. In it, Bierman sports the white lab coat, white shirt, conservative necktie, and a stethoscope around his neck. The second photo is what Bierman says should be the new doctor's uniform. Basically, you have a photograph of me wearing a scrub uniform, which is short-sleeved. And you also note that in that short sleeve, I'm not wearing a watch, which is important because watches can also be very heavily colonized, and they are not cleaned in between patients. In addition, I'm wearing a black vest. And we're using the black university logo vest. It's kind of the new equivalent of a lab coat. It has short sleeves, so it satisfies the bare below the elbows recommendation. But it also has kind of pockets. And the pockets are actually very helpful because it allows you to put things in your pockets, like a pen, a pen light, mobile phone, those kind of things. So it has kind of a functional utilitarian capacity to it also. I think it's gotten very popular. So now medical students are wearing, their scrubs are green color, not blue, but green with a black vest. Many of the service lines have their own black vest with the VCU logo on it and then the name of the service line on the other chest. However, Bierman says not all medical staff are enamored of this new look. We've noticed that certainly there's some laggards or those that don't want to make changes. They tend to be older folk and they also tend to be physicians. I think those pictures are reversed. I don't think I would feel comfortable going to someone who is dressed like that, as most likely they're probably employing what they call evidence-based attire with actually no firm evidence behind that. That's Dr. Christopher Petrilli, chief medical resident at the University of Michigan Health System. The reason why he's in the scrubs and the white coat in the U.K. in the late 2000s, they established this dress code called Bare Below the Elbows. And they thought that that was going to reduce the number of transmitted infections from providers to their patients. And it really, when you control for all of the other policy changes that they did, such as improving hand hygiene, there was no difference after that policy was implemented. Bierman concedes his research doesn't prove unequivocally that disease is transmitted from white coats to patients triggering infection. So Petrilli says until then, doctors should continue to wear them. But why does he so forcefully advocate for lab coats? Petrilli is lead researcher of an ongoing study called TAILOR, an acronym standing for Targeting Attire to Improve Likelihood of Rapport. What we found in our study is basically across different contexts of care, there was slight variation in what patients were either expecting their physician to wear or what they would prefer their physician to be wearing. When patients did have a specific preference, Overwhelmingly, it was for a formal attire with a white coat, but occasionally, and this mostly was seen in acute care settings such as the ICU or emergency department, providers that were in scrubs were actually sometimes more preferred, but only in those settings. The purpose of our study was to show that even though some providers might be going more casual, that perhaps their patients don't want them to. So I feel like since the uniform of a physician is their white coat, I feel like that's why patients feel more comfortable because that's what they're expecting.
And everybody knows that when you put that uniform on, that you stand for something. That's Peter Self, who's sort of an expert in the psychology of uniforms. He's team leader of member experience for the Boy Scouts of America and says uniforms immediately and strongly shape our expectations of the people wearing them. For example, just outside of our uniform even, you go to a park and you watch a pickup game of basketball, and there are some great players in some of our parks around the country. But the fact that they're just playing in shirts and skins, nobody's going to pay to see that. You'll just walk by and say, oh, great, good job. But the minute you put them in a uniform in an auditorium, and all of a sudden there's an expectation that they have better skills, they're playing at a higher level, that they command more of your attention, and there's more significance to that and structure to that team. I think that's true of most uniforming. It has that effect on us. We somehow associate that organization or the fact that they're more connected to one another and more organized with their efficiency and their proficiency. But that's not how it is in some doctor's offices. Some physicians have shed any kind of uniform that identifies themselves as a doctor other than a name tag. Your female physician might enter the exam room wearing a floral print dress, or your male doctor might be wearing a polo shirt and khakis. Self says he noticed right away when his own doctor stopped wearing the white lab coat. He did when I first started going to him, and he doesn't any longer. And it's a different visit than it used to be. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's more just like hanging out with your friend. So if I hadn't been seeing him for a while before he made that change, it would have made a difference in whether I stuck around with him or not. I don't think it's the white coat actually as much as it is the provider. So if you take a provider whose patients are not overall happy with and then put a white coat on that person, that was previously dressing casually, we're not saying that that is automatically going to make this person an excellent physician. But I do feel that when providers put on the white coat and when their patients see them in the white coat, that it does allow for a sense of confidence, both on the patient side and also the provider does feel an increased sense of confidence wearing that white coat. My guess is if enough providers see the evidence that there's no transmission risk of infection from a white coat and we are able to show that white coats and formal attire do improve the overall patient experience and their level of satisfaction, then I think that we will be seeing more white coats being used even by those who currently gave them up. You can learn more about all of our guests by visiting our website, radiohealthjournal.net, where you can also find archives of our shows. You'll also find them on iTunes and Stitcher. Our entire program this week was written and produced by Polly Hansen. Our production directors are Sean Waldron and Nick Hofstra. I'm Nancy Benson. Managing a serious GI issue, such as irritable bowel syndrome, can make holiday meal planning a stressful chore. Here's medical nutrition therapist and registered dietitian Patsy Katsos. Patsy, can we still enjoy traditional holiday favorites by eliminating trigger foods? Yes. In fact, a new survey conducted on behalf of VSL number 3 shows that more than 60% of IBS sufferers make changes to their diet on their own to manage their symptoms. I recommend low FODMAP. 75% of IBS sufferers get relief from IBS symptoms when following a low FODMAP diet, low in certain sugars and fibers that are poorly absorbed by the small intestine. Also, incorporating a high-potency probiotic medical food like VSL number 3 is clinically proven to be beneficial in the dietary management of IBS. Look for Patsy's new IBS-friendly holiday recipes at vsl3.com. Don't forget to check for VSL number 3 behind the pharmacy counter or order online at vsl3.com with the code DOCTOR for $5 off. Medicare and their list of suppliers continue to change, so if you have diabetes, it may affect where you get your testing supplies, but rest assured that your number one doctor-recommended one-touch testing supplies are always covered by Medicare Part B at your local pharmacy and approved mail-order suppliers. Dr. Brian Levy, Chief Medical Officer at LifeScan, maker of one-touch products. Some mail-order suppliers may offer a limited selection of diabetes testing supplies. They may try to switch you to a different brand, saying your current products are no longer covered. That's just not true. You are entitled to continue using the products you know and trust and that have been recommended by your health care professional at no additional cost. Remember, you have a choice. Stay with a number one brand used by Medicare patients. For questions about coverage or where to get your one-touch testing supplies, call 1-866-621-6216 or visit www.onetouch.com slash Medicare. Medicare Part B is not a guarantee of coverage and payment, which may be subject to coinsurance, deductible, and patient eligibility requirements.